Amen. Thank you, James. Just a closer walk with thee. What a wonderful, wonderful song to preach or to sing before we, we talk about First Thessalonians. All right. First Thessalonians chapter 5, if you have your Bibles close at hand. We are looking at verses 19 through 22. And First Thessalonians has been a treat to preach through. And I'm also now looking now towards the end, but then also the beginning of Second Thessalonians. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Let me take care of something real fast with the making sure my computer is up to date. All right. If you find yourself there in First Thessalonians chapter number five, begin at verse number nineteen. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good, abstain from all appearance of evil. Let's pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the message. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this time together. Father, may you do a work in our hearts and our minds tonight that we will be better equipped for the walk that you have for us this week. Father, we don't know what's going to happen this next week. We don't know of the trials that might come our way. We don't know about the blessings that will come our way as well. But Father, we, we look to you. We look by faith according to your word as to what you're going to do in us and through us this next week. And Father, we thank you for Sunday being the day that we come together and to learn from your word. May you, through your spirit tonight, help us to be encouraged as we think more and more about your word. Father, may you help each person here. Meet us where we have a need. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At times, it is easy to preach than other times. I suppose that that would be the case for a lot of different people, depending on the circumstances of preaching, depends on the environment of preaching, depends on the people of preaching. Sometimes it's easier to preach at times than others. This is an interesting dilemma that I have because this text tells us what we ought to be doing while somebody is preaching. And so there's many things that people do that encourage me as I preach. So we'll start there and then talk about the text. I love it and am encouraged by people when, you know, they have good eye contact with me. I love that. Uh, anytime that somebody closes their eyes, I, I think, okay, they're either praying or well, let's just say they're praying. Uh, <laughs> yeah, only, I got to tell about this one time. It was really interesting. You know, this one time um, for, and it, yes, it was just one time, because uh, I don't remember any other time. I was speaking here on a Wednesday, and at that point in time, we were doing afternoon services. Not the best time uh, to do it. I, I now understand that. And so I was going through what I was preaching about, and, uh, and somebody um, fell asleep. That's no problem. I, I don't mind people falling asleep, but I decided that to end when the person started snoring very loudly during service. I thought, well, there's no way I'm going to get around this, so let me just go ahead and pray, and we'll get to our next thing. So, <laughs> but it's, it's good times like that, right? Um, to think about what we do as we hear a sermon will help us as we go on in our lives. A lot of times when I listen to a sermon, whether it be when Pastor Lapino was here speaking and doing a great job of preaching the word, and I appreciate him and his ministry very much, and such an encouragement that was, you know, to hear your, you and, and talking about the word of God, amazing. So I look up to you, Pastor. I appreciate that very much. I listened to some other pastors and uh, 
on on YouTube you have no um, yeah you have no uh, what's the word I'm going with no smallity that's not the word but that's it's pretty close you have a lot of 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 uh, people to listen to you could just put in a name and then all of a sudden it pops up all these sermons you could go with anybody that you've known anybody that you've listened to you probably find something uh, but what do we do while somebody preaches. That is the necessity of what we're going to speak about tonight. So notice with me in verse number 19, we're going to start right here. And the first thing that we have to have when we are listening to a sermon or when we read our Bibles or when we're having our quiet time with Him each day, first of all, number one, we have to have a soft heart towards the Spirit's guidance. We have to have a soft heart Toward the Spirit's guidance. Notice with me what verse 19 says. It says, quench not the Spirit. Now it's an amazing doctrine that we have of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. According to what the Bible says, when the moment that you and I got saved, we have the person of the Holy Spirit indwelling us. This is different from any other point in time before the church age. We see in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit came upon somebody to do a magnificent thing. Like, for instance, Samson comes to mind that he evidently didn't look strong. But when the Spirit of God came upon him, he was as strong as what you would think of a, well, a superhero would be in the comic books. It's beyond human strength that he had. He lifted up these gates of a city and broke them off their, their hinges and then went for a hike up a mountain and then threw them down. I can't do that. At least, no, okay. <laughs> At least not, not right now, especially when I was younger. I was a little bit stronger when I was younger because actually I worked out a bit. But I, I was never that buff. I was never that abil- have the ability to do the things that he did. The Spirit of God moved upon people in the Old Testament to do magnificent things for him. For instance, uh, who made the ark, and specifically the ark of the covenant, and that his name is Bezalel. You think, okay, that's a name I haven't heard of before. Well, Bezalel was, well, the Spirit of God came upon him and gave him all the wisdom and knowledge that he needed in order to do the work that God had before him. And so, Once again, the Spirit of God came upon an individual in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, He indwells the believers. What a difference. What a magnificent difference is that He is with us all the time. Not sometimes He's on us, sometimes He's not. He's with us all the time. And not only that, we have the promise of God through His Word that He is with us forever. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He is with us. And this is one of the things that that when I was studying about once saved, always saved, because I didn't believe it once upon a time, it occurred to me that if if I died and I go to hell, the Holy Spirit is in me if I'm saved. And so what does that mean if I lose my salvation? Well, He's coming with me because I put my faith in Christ. He is indwelling me. Oh, I lost my salvation because I did whatever wrong that wasn't covered by the blood, which, honestly, that doesn't even sound like it goes together. But everything's under the blood. Otherwise, it's up to us. It's up to our doings, our workings, and hopefully we get it right. No, if we can lose our salvation, we would. Yeah, there's no way we could keep it. There's no way I can be perfect enough. But because of what Christ did on the cross, that's the finished work of Christ. Once saved, yeah, I put my faith on Christ. He forgives me of all my sin. Past, present, future. It's all covered. Praise the Lord. So, with that in mind, we have the Holy Spirit in us. The same Holy Spirit's in me, the same Holy Spirit's in you. And as Pastor Lapino pointed out many times, that the Holy Spirit in me will not fight the Holy Spirit in you. Right? (laughs) So, if there is any disunity within the church, then there's something wrong with, okay, somebody's not being spirit-filled, or there are a lot of people that aren't spirit-filled, and there's conflicts. So think about it. Quench not the spirit. What does quench mean? Well, we, o- we always hear about, okay, 
quench your thirst. That's Sprite, which that, it doesn't quench the thirst. That actually makes it worse, I think. Um, quenching the thirst, that you get water. Um, that quenches the thirst. What does it mean to quench the thirst? To stop, to satisfy, to make it so that your thirst is gone. Quenching the spirit, quenching fire. Think about this. When we were leaving church this morning, you know, we, were, we left about, I think it was about noon or so, that we left, 12.30, 12.40, okay, <laughs> I'm way off. Uh, <laughs> I, I left this afternoon, that's right. And so I, when we were coming out, we noticed that something was amiss over here uh, by, on 474, um, nearby 27, and there was smoke just billowing in the air. I thought, oh no. Um, well, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll have to be aware of that. So we, we left. By the time we left, it was dying out. It was being quenched. The fire was going down. Now, you're asking me, well, what happened? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't because, but it was great in that it was right there because right across the street is the firehouse. So perfect time, perfect place. So if you quench a, uh, a fire... You're stopping it. You have a candle. You want to quench the candle so it's no longer a fire, but rather just a billow of smoke. You blow it out. Like what we experience with our Christmas Eve service with the candles. We blow it out. You quench it. Just like that, we can quench the Holy Spirit if we don't have a soft heart to Him. And we say, no. The Holy Spirit's convicting us to do whatever it is, X, Y, or Z. Okay? According to his word, when we read his word, we're having quiet time with him or we're hearing a sermon and the Holy Spirit is tugging on your heart to repent of something and then you say, no. I don't want to. No, you can't make me. No, I don't want to do that. Whether it be like that of witnessing, whether it be that of giving, whether it be that of you name it. If the Holy Spirit's saying, hey, you need to do this. Hey, this is what you ought to do to your coworker tomorrow. Tell him about Christ. No, I am not doing that. What you're doing is you're stopping the working of the Holy Spirit in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives. Quench not the Spirit. So when we're listening to a sermon and we're preaching on something, it could be something that the person's preaching on or it could be something that is on your mind and the Holy Spirit brings it up. Like for instance, there's sometimes that people come and say, hey, thank you for preaching about X, Y, and Z. I was really convicted. And you think to yourself, I didn't preach on the next Y and Z. I preach on something else. So entirely different. But yet the Holy Spirit still has the guidance and the, the reign in our lives to say, okay, this is a conviction. This is a conviction. This is a conviction. And if we don't take heed to that, or it's an encouragement of stop doing something, like there's sin in your life, you should stop doing that. And if we say, okay, then we're submitting to the Spirit. We're letting Him have His full reign in our lives. And we do what is will, he does much more for us if we have a soft heart, not a hard one. Hard heart you see in the Old Testament. You see that with Israel. They had a hard heart to God. God says one thing, they do it completely different. In Isaiah, it's a, it's a funny picture that he gives, although it's heartbreaking when you understand what it's talking about. He says, all day long I'm opening my arms to a obstinate, stubborn, hard-hearted people that go the other way. And it's kind of like, and then it, it talks about, and there's a nation, a people, a people group that's coming after me that I didn't, I didn't call for. I didn't seek after. I'm seeking after Israel. Israel doesn't want me. It's going the opposite way, but there's other nations that want me. Talking about that of the church. We're all Gentiles here for the most part. I don't know if you have Jewish uh, background in you. I don't. Um, but yep, praise the Lord for Jewish people. Praise the Lord for people trying to reach the Jewish people. But all of us, we're Gentiles. We're part of that nation that 
God didn't say seek after, that God didn't call, God called Israel, but not us, but we still came. And so, quench not the Spirit. Israel always quenched the Spirit at times when they were most prosperous. When they had the most amount of money, the most amount of pleasure, they were the most idolatrous. Because they did not say, and they did not say thank you, to the Lord. And they quenched the Spirit over and over. And Paul here is telling the church of Thessalonica, don't quench the Spirit as he's leading and guiding you to do what God's Word says, God's will says for you to do. So that's number one. Uh, is have a soft heart toward the Spirit's guidance. Number two, number two, have open ears toward teachings. Have open ears toward teachings. Notice with me what it says in verse 20. Despise not prophesyings. Despise not prophesyings. Now, there is a difference between that of what a pastor does on a Sunday, or what a Sunday school teacher would do on Sunday than that which a prophet did back then. In the New Testament, there were prophets at that point in time going from church to church and prophesying in the name of the Lord. That today, we don't have that. I'll explain why. So the prophets there would have direct revelation from God to them, to the people. And they would speak in the name of the Lord. Now, same uh, thoughts about if they were false prophets, you need to understand, okay, what is their teachings like? And what the early church did with the New Testament prophets is that they took the teachings and what was prophesied and compared that to Christ's teachings from what they understood as well as the apostles' teachings in what they gave. Okay, so they don't have the completed word of God. So they had prophets going from church to church and prophesying direct revelation from God to the people. Now, we don't have that. And the reason why is because the word of God is complete. We have the complete word. We have Genesis through Revelation. That is the complete revelation that God has given us in written form. Now we don't need apostles, and we don't have them. That's good. At least if there's somebody that you say, oh, this apostle so-and-so, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really go with titles at that point because I disagree. Or prophet so-and-so. No, no, <laughs> let's, let's, let's forget that title and just, okay. No prophecy because of First Corinthians chapter 13. Let me turn there. Let me just kind of throw this out there just to have you think about, ponder about. First, Thessal or First Corinthians, there we are. Chapter 13 is often referred to as the love chapter. But he gives an indication as to why it is that certain signs of the early church stopped. Okay? Notice with me in verse number, if you're there with me, verse number 8. It says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail or stop. Whether they, there be tongues, they shall cease or stop stop. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. This is special knowledge, special revelation from God. It shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So the question for, for the church is, okay, have the, the signs, the prophecies being prophets or that of having tongues and unknown languages, have all the, these things stopped? And historically, according to what we understand from church history, the answer is yes, they have stopped. Why? Because we have the complete revelation of God. And so, when we come to this, this verse, despise not prophesying. Well, what is that meant for you and me today? We don't have prophets. We don't have prophesying. We don't have people making predictions about future events or saying something authoritative about what Christ would say. We have the Word of God. But here's the thing about it is that easy enough, each and every one of us, we could hear the truth of God's Word, the teaching, the rightly dividing the Word of truth, 
And with that, we could close our ears and either A, stop being so distracted that you, you're not paying attention. Sometimes that happens. Sometimes our minds wander. It's natural, uh, but it's so easy to get distracted by, oh, it's kind of warm in here. You know, it's, uh, uh, I don't like those fans on right there. Oh, you know, why do you have to wear that tie? It just, it doesn't go. You know, it, you could get distracted by many different things, but the thought about it is hearing and being attentive to the teachings that are given and not in your heart despising them, that they're not contemptible to you. Despise not prophesying. This means that we have open ears to think about the things that God would have us to think about, not to condemn or contempt of that of the Word of God itself. There's a huge problem if that is our, what, we, what we take to hear a sermon or read our Bibles. If we say, ah, that, that, that's not for me. I, I don't want to. You're despising the prophesying of the Word of God. So have open ears to hear the teachings that God has for us. Number three, last but not least, have an examining mind. Have an examining mind. Um, look with me at verse number uh, 20. Oh, I'm still in 1 Corinthians. I don't know about you. I'm in 1 Corinthians. So for, turn back with me to 1 Thessalonians, um, chapter 5. Oh, we're going back there. All right. Chapter 5, we're looking at verse number 21. It says, Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. So here's what we ought to be doing. The word prove there is that of examine, or to think about it another way, of discerning. A huge uh, problem in American Christianity today is the lack of discernment among people. It, it's just amazing to see what the number one books of, the, of, our, of our region it's like. The number one books of the best-selling Christian books out there. It's kind of scary. There was one book that was number one, and it became, even eventually became a movie. Um, I don't recommend reading the book. I don't re recommend seeing the movie, but it's called The Shack. It is absolutely terrible. Like, I was asked to read it, and I, I know that there's a really, really sad story in the beginning, but I, I, I thought, I'm skipping that emotional stuff Get, out, get away from me. I'm going to the nitty-gritty doctrine stuff. Okay, what does it talk about God? I, I, don't, I don't need your emotionalism to get me, oh, this is so sad. It is a sad story, true, because things happen that, oh, wow, this is terrible. Uh, oh, so sad and such a heartbreaking story. Yeah, well, let's get to the, to the nitty-gritty stuff. Doctrine. Okay, I have a problem when a book <laughs> depicts God the Father as a elderly black woman. I was asked at one point in time when I was in high school, why can't God be a woman? I'll say this very, and I, I didn't know exactly what to say then. Uh, right now, I do know what to say. Well, God's word, his self-revelation to us, he's always a he. He is never a she, ever. 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 <laughs> you can make a, a, a thought about oh, the Holy Spirit's named it. Okay. But it's never a she. So, okay. I got an issue with that. Then we have Jesus as, well, just merely a fallible human being. You know, that makes mistakes and does different things. I thought, no, that's not Jesus. You might have the ethnicity, right? He is Middle Eastern. Yeah, that's true. But he's perfect. He's perfect. Otherwise, he's not a savior. <laughs> and then we have the Holy Spirit being an Asian woman. Once again, I'm like, no, it's either a he or it's a it. It cannot be a she. So, and then with it, there was a lot of realms of, uh, of universalism, like everybody's God's child. Well, the Bible says no. There's, there's the children of God through the redemption that's in Christ. And then there's the children of the devil. 
There's no either or. Or there's no middle ground between them. Yikes. And that was number one in Christian circles. Lack of discernment in Christianity today. Just amazing. So it says in 1 Thessalonians that when we hear something, when we hear or read something, like for instance, I, I, I'm a big fan of commentaries because they give insights into the text that otherwise I would not have any clue about. Sometimes I would disagree with them, but sometimes I, oh, this is very interesting. Oh, so that's what a cubit is. Oh, that's what, you know, this, that, and the other. You know, we had a good discussion in Sunday school class, in Matilda's uh, Sunday school class, talking about the tabernacle. And, man, there's a lot of stuff you can get, you can get bogged down in the details of the tabernacle, but very interesting. But yet, if you did not have a commentary to say, okay, this, that, and the other about the tabernacle, well, you'd be reading a long time about the description of the tabernacle at the end of Exodus and say, boy, this is long, <laughs> and to try to get to the next thing. But yeah, it's, it's good in detail. See, the thing about it, if we don't have the ability to discern whether it is good teaching or bad teaching, we're in trouble. What we ought to do, here's what, this is going to make me self-conscious. You're supposed to take the words that I preach and then go into the Bible and see if it's true. To be Berean Christians, I love the church in Berea, uh, the book of Acts, that they studied to make sure the things that the Apostle Paul was teaching was accurate according to the text. So when I say something, you can ask me, where did you get that information from? And I should be able to give it to you. For instance, you know, I have so many different commentaries, I I read a few, and then I take down notes and say, okay, this is what this one says, this one, what that one says. Okay, then you say, well, where'd you get that information from? Well, according to this one, that one, or the other, I can narrow it down to the one I actually got it from. But there's a lot of pastors out there that you say, hey, where'd you get your information from? Just kind of came to me. <laughs> well, that's not good enough. What's according to the text? And so it says, prove all things. So this is the teaching. This is the understanding that of hearing something about like commentaries, hearing the word of God being preached, being spoken, being taught. You need to make sure that it is according to the word of God. And notice with me what it says. It says, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. So there's two things that he's talking about here. That which is being taught that according to the word of God is good. The things that we ought to do that is good. Like for instance, whether, uh, let's see. In, in, okay, <laughs> I'm blanking here. Okay, so uh, be careful for nothing. There it is. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, make your request made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. My paraphrase. Okay. Um, what's good in that? Well, what's really good is we can pray. What's really good is we can pray with thanksgiving. What's really good is that God keeps us in our hearts and our minds in peace. A peace that passeth all understanding in Christ Jesus. That's good. Oh, take that. Oh, take that. Oh, take that. That's good. Abstain from the appearance, from all appearance of evil. What is that? Well, that which is evil, according to the word of God, we abstain from it such a degree that you can't even look like that. Like, for instance, be careful for nothing. What does that mean? Don't be worried. Here's something that really bothered me. I am, at times, worrier. <laughs> uh, I, at times, in my flesh, worry about the most insignificant things. I heard a statistic that, uh, according, I think it was like 80% of the time, that the things that we worry about never happen. <laughs> I thought, oh, wow, that, that, that is so true, though. Everything that we worry about, a uh, certain percentage of it, the things that we worry tremendously about, they never happen. They're just hypothetical in, um, in, in our minds. 
but yet to abstain from all appearance of evil, the things that God says not to do, it shouldn't even be a look about us that we're doing it. One time I walked off campus. Uh, you could do that. Well, at least guys could. Um, guy, girls needed a, a, a bunny. Guys could go off by themselves just for safety purposes. Um, so, guy, so I went by myself and I walked. I spent some good time, quality time with the Lord, just praying and, and going to a store and, and buying some, some uh, a beverage. And what I bought was A&W root beer. Hmm. Good stuff. Especially from the tap at an A&W restaurant. Oh, can't beat it. The bottle is nothing compared to that. Anyway, they make it with real sugar. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> anyway, but the odd thing about it is when I bought it, and I was drinking it as I was walking back, just praying and thinking, and looking at this bottle, I thought to myself, I might get stopped because this bottle of A&W root beer looks suspiciously like it's alcoholic beverage because the bottle that it was, it's shaped in, it looks like a glass bottle. I thought to myself, oh no, what did I do? Uh, abstain from all the appearance of evil. Like I'm drinking this bottle of questionable uh, uh, liquid coming back to Pensacola Christian College. The guards are there. I look at them. They look at me. I'm drinking. and I make sure that the A&W label is like right out center. You know, they, I don't think they really care. So <laughs> I just walk and they didn't say anything. So I'm like, all right, we're good. So I drank the rest real quick and threw it away. And I'm like, okay, let's not do that again. That, that was kind of odd. But it's a, it's a humorous illustration of something that, well, could be a problem in a lot of Christians' lives today of, well, there's something evil that the Bible says, this is wrong. Let's abstain from it. No, let's go a bit further. Abstain from even the appearance of evil. So when the person that's preaching is preaching on something that is good, we should hold fast to that. We should take it and not let it go. Cleave to it. But when somebody's preaching, teaching, commentary, this is wrong. This is evil. We not only abstain from it, we say no to it. You know, I love what when I grew up because you still had this, this anti-drug thing, you know, dare, just say no. Somebody was critical about that that I listened to recently. I'm like, oh, but that helped me. <laughs> you want this cigarette? Just say no. No. You want this drink of alcohol? No. You, we could go down the line of d different questionable drugs that, uh, that were in my school when I was there. But they knew not to ask because they knew my answer was no. So not only saying no, but going a step further and saying, I don't want even to have the appearance of that over there, whatever that might be. So for all of us, and how we listen to a sermon, how we go about reading our Bibles, and the way that we should go about understanding what God's Word says versus what God's will is for our lives, we should ought to have this spirit about us that, yes, we are open to the things of God. We're not going to say no when He says yes, and we're not going to say yes when He says no. And when something is good, we are going to cleave to it. When something is evil, we're going to abstain it from such a degree that it's not even a question to other people that that's not true about you whatsoever. Can't be true whatsoever. So I hope this has been encouraging um, for each and every one of us just to make sure that when we come to the service, when we hear a sermon, when we are taught the Word of God, that we are open to what God has for us, but also discerning as to what the person is saying, knowing that that person is fallible, what does the Word of God say? And then to say yes to the good and absolutely not to the evil. Let's go ahead and pray.